extraordinary moment. Uh, we've been waiting 20 plus years for this film, and um, I can't believe I'm standing here. We're at the beginning of the press tour, so forgive my innate nervousness, but uh, I'm going to try and express very briefly what this film means. Um, and it begins and ends with Sir Ridley Scott, the great, the boss, everything. Um, absolutely. Him passing me, this has totally changed my life, but um, the trickle-down effect he has with his ambition and his work ethic from John T. Yates and John Matheson and everybody in between just makes this film, to my mind, one of the most epic I've seen, if I do say so myself, in, in the last 10, 15 years. So, um, Myself, Denzel, Connie, and Fred are super excited to chat to you all, but I hope you enjoy the film and see you after. All right, see you later. Denzel Washington, Connie Nielsen, and Paul Mescal. Okay, everyone have a seat. Damn, that was a movie, wasn't it? Seriously. Um, I got to see it a little while ago, and Paul, I want to start with you because I appreciate the journey that took us to get to this epic started with Ridley Scott doing what a lot of us did, which is watch you and Daisy fall in and out of love in normal people. And then you met with him and he sort of offered you the role, but I'm curious, what was it about Lucius and those first conversations that intrigued you? Obviously, you wanted to work with Ridley, wanted to work with Denzel, wanted to be a part of this, but what was it about the character that really you wanted to get into? Um, I, su I suppose Lucius represented something to me that I had never done before, like somebody who is quite front-footed through the, through the two and a half hours, and I hadn't got to do that before and and it's something that has been kind of latently within me something that's more muscular something that's more kind of um full of something that people ha hadn't seen and of course as you said it's if ridley asks you to do something you just say yes <laughs> as quickly as possible uh i think one of the most intriguing part of your performance is the fact that this is something we haven't really seen you do which is do vengeance and do sort of that sort of thing which was the most attractive sort of color you got to play as an actor that was new for you in this one? Um, I, I think venge vengeance is interesting for a certain period of the film, but once that that has a certain runway that you certainly you, you run out of runway very quickly with that, and I think vengeance is a kind of symptom of the life that he's led. He feels. Um, somewhat deserted by his mother and he's incorrect about that but at the moment through the film that's what's driving a lot of it but also when you have vengeance matched with somebody and i think lucius is very intelligent i think you've got an interesting um outline for a hero at the end of, at the center of a, of a story uh mr denzel washington sir yes um <laughs> listen, yes please more um what you do with macroness is just i can't even kind of describe it with words i just wanted to watch it over again and i loved how you said at this point in your career knowing all the roles that you've played it takes an intriguing filmmaker or an intriguing character for you to say that you wanted to sign up what was that about macroness that you really wanted to explore with ridley and did you get to in this endeavor do something that you hadn't gotten to do before Question. What was the first part? Uh, what did you find interesting about Macronus, and what was well, intriguing? It, it, it's the same thing. It's Ridley. It, it's Ridley. It's Gladiator. It's yes. <laughs> this is why I gave. Yeah, I mean that is simple. Um, this, the performance is not. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. Uh, you get to do a lot. I feel at the beginning you were like. Honestly, it felt like I was watching you in Training Day again, and by the end, I felt I was watching you in the tragedy of Macbeth. Like, it was such a journey. Um, what was that, I would say, what was your approach to the sort of duplicity of Macronus? And like how, I think folks are going into this movie thinking it's one thing, and then they're going to kind of discover it as they, as they play. How was your approach with his sort of, I don't know, his, he's like Iago. Mm. 
no, he's, he's misunderstood. <laughs> he's misunderstood. He's, he's a nice fellow. He's <laughs> a product of his environment. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I'm going to get it really simple for you. How did, how did you approach his secrecy, his duplicity, and how he was trying to use this man as his instrument? He's trying to use everybody. He used his mother. He used his own children. He used his... He'd already used up his soul, so he didn't have any left. But, uh, you know, he's, he's in bed with the devil. Uh, Ms. Kylie Nielsen, ma'am, uh, I love that you're back here um, looking fabulous again. I was like, this is not days later. Um, but I will say with your character, you had, I think, the enviable opportunity to be able to look back at what Ridley was doing back in 2000 and 1998 when y'all filmed that one, and then look at what he's doing now and kind of compare. Um, if you could, I'd love for you to talk about what he was doing back then with that one that kind of kept true to this one, and how he's evolved as a filmmaker and what he was asking for you in this one. Well, I mean, back in the day, I think it was Joaquin who had this line, which was, <clears throat> you know, we were about to do the Roman Empire with the guy who'd done Blade Runner, and that he would do for the Roman Empire what, what Ridley with Blade Runner did for the like, futurism. And to me, when when we went in there, I could see how he was just creating these textures, whether they are textures of acting or or the textures of the actual environment that he puts you in and that he creates around you. These textures feel very visceral when you're on set. And it was the same this time around. Um, this time around, what would have taken three hours to set up 25 years ago, now it takes 20 minutes. And that is despite the fact that you're talking 3,000 extras, you're talking like enormous vehicles, you're talking like insane setups, and we could not believe how fast we were moving. And that is because Ridley also loves technology. He's always interested in like the latest technology, and. There were things that I know that he wanted to do in number one that he simply did not have the technology for yet. And yet he was using like cutting edge technology in order to make up for the fact that we lost Oliver Reed sort of halfway through the shoot. And he wanted to honor Oliver Reed's character and he wasn't gonna cut him out. He wasn't gonna, he was gonna try to save and salvage that incredible performance and, 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 you know, one of the things I also talked to, you know, our younger actors about was, you know, Ridley allows you to be free. And it's the same now as it was 25 years ago. He knows the sound he wants to hear. And, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to let you try everything, but he knows where he wants you to hit. It's, it's a fantastic experience as an actor. Uh, Fred, sir, um, I, I have to almost call it a two-person performance with what you and Joseph are doing. It is It feels almost like a Hydra type thing, and you are deliciously evil. <laughs> deliciously evil. Um, but I'm curious how you and Joseph put that together, because if you really look at you two in the scenes, like the way you move together, the way you are almost battling each other as much as you're battling outside forces, how did y'all sort of develop that physical aspect of these two twins, uh, emperors, together? Because again, yeah, it's the two of them in every scene. Thank you. Um, I, I feel like Joseph and I were like an old vaudevillian couple preparing this. <laughs> You know, we'd like gather every night, we'd go over the week's work, and and uh, we were well aware that this was in some ways a double act, and then in other key ways, um, a very competitive, charged opposites as well. And so, um, yeah, it was really a play. You know, I, I know he wishes he could be here today too and, and sends his love. Um, 
and uh, uh, but it really was so fun to build the history with him and work on it collectively, and then also know that that, that we we had our secrets and we had our independence together too. So I, I really do, uh, there were key sequences and moments that I felt um, were choreographed, like we were. Um, a couple just traveling around the country doing our dances together. I really dig that. Um, yes, Pedro and Joseph could not be here. They're off being uh, fantastic with two others. But uh, in their absence, uh, Paul, I want to talk to you a little bit about it. This is the beginning of the press tour. You're going to get a lot of questions about how many chicken breasts you had to eat and how many yeah, stairs. No, no, we, I'm trying to be elevated. Um, how many stairs you had to take to get those thighs to look like that. Like, I get it, I get it, but I'm not going to do that. I'm actually more curious about what the more challenging aspects were to Lucius's emotional journey. If there was something that you particularly felt that you had to get very dialed in about that was harder than maybe some of the more physical things that you had to do? Well, I, I don't think the two things are separated, actually. It's like if you're going to play some, like when you read the script, you go, in reality, how would this person survive? And I have this like naive um, idea at the start where I was like, I'm maybe going to just play a gladiator that kind of looks normal. <laughs> it's like, I, well, I don't think that's going to cut it because I think Lucius is both, I always saw him like a dog, like somebody who would just scrap his way to survival. And I think psychologically, the thing that I wanted to focus on is like, why that is the case and the reason that I think he survives isn't because he's strong or any of those things it's because he actually doesn't really care if he lives or dies until the final scene with Denzel and there's something bigger to live into but then you're when you unpack that you're actually dealing with somebody who's incredibly depressed and morbid but also that lends a certain uh, chaos to a character which it is a tricky thing to kind of get your psychology around because if you unpack it, it's, it's, it, it runs much deeper than you think. Um, one thing I also want to applaud you for is, I don't know if other people, uh, Lucius is kind of sassy. Like he's got bars. Like he is uh, giving as good as he gets in this. And I actually liked how that comedy from the first one also sort of like played through in this one. Um, Connie, I want to talk a little bit to you first because there's a duality in the script. There's the hero that we expect and the hero that sort of emerges later. There's the villain that we expect and then the villain that emerges later. And between your character and Denzel, they're both trying to use Lucius as an instrument. And I think her journey to this time in between the first film to now is really, I think, instructive of what we see for her. So I'd love for you to explain what Ridley told you about what she's been dealing with to get her at this moment where she's still trying to save the Republic, but she's lost a lot. Um, <clears throat> to me, she is really situated in like this whole idea of Marcus Aurelius. And when she interacts with Lucius, it really is about how is she going to bring this, this heritage and bring that heritage to Lucius. She's lost very valuable time as a parent to do precisely that imprinting of those values on and that culture, that thinking, that, that sense of respect for um, what power is and how it should be wielded. And, um, and what she finds is a person who has somehow learned it already by himself. Um, so I think that that's a really beautiful sort of flow of energy. Um, she, on the other hand, has had to learn to survive from wielding power unwillingly and in a form that she finds horrific to like, just in terms of what human nature is best at, which is being free. <clears throat> Here she has been anything but free. She's been a prisoner and she's been used to um, legitimize completely illegitimate power. And um, that, that act must have been something that I 
ask myself, you know, how do you stand out in front of a crowd of your fellow citizens and with your very being, you legitimize that which is unmentionable. Uh, forced to, that's how. Um, Mr. Denzel Washington, sir, I loved your quote. It's Cecil B. DeMille on steroids when you're on a uh, Ridley Scott set. You said it, not me. Um, but with did all, I? yes, you did. I have it on video. Um, <laughs> it's on the featurette. Um, but I'm curious, for the actor, it's about the moment. It's about the performance. It's about the person sitting across from you. I'm curious what you or Ridley or your scene partners do to not let the scale of all that is happening sort of get in the way of these intimate moments? And how do you keep the performance as intimate as you do? Because it is a very emotionally intimate movie, even though it does have all these huge bells and whistles. What Ridley did, which was great, is he, he built room. So all we had to do was put the clothes on and start talking. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, I'm, I mean, he built Rome. When we would walk around, you were in Rome. And it seemed like 10,000 extras and horses. I mean, it was, it, it was make-believe. It was, it was play. You know, it was fun. Just put the gear on. Just put the dress on and go. But, you know, that's the way I looked at it. I'm, I'm putting this dress on, these rings, and I'm going crazy. <laughs> And he did. Um, clear some space on the shelf. Um, listen, uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the writer, David, and a couple of the producers are here. And they mentioned how you are like a jazz musician with this part, that it is interesting and playful in every sort of scene. Um, and they said that you took a lot more into what uh, Macronus ended up being. I'm curious if there was something on the page that jumped out at you that wasn't as explicit, but that you wanted to bring to your performance. I don't even remember what was on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me that again. You said what? <laughs> what was something you added, your special sauce to Macronus? Because they said that no, there was no, no. It comes from if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Okay. It starts with the words. So you. You know, you had the words, you had the great actors, you had the environment, you had the swords, the horses, you had it all. You know, you had everything at your disposal and a the most brilliant director. Uh, Fred, I want to bring it to you. I guess everyone can talk to this, but the costuming uh, that Yantu did, like your look, first of all, how you sort of crafted the character. He's a chaos agent, obviously, and it's a very broad performance, but it still has to be dialed in. Um, were there little touches to the look that you sort of discussed as far as how you wanted him to present? And how early on did they land on what you and Joseph ended up doing? A bit, uh, weeks and weeks of, of dialing in that, that level of um, excess. You know, I, I kind of think of him as uh, rod and gold. So it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's every glitz and glamour, but there's true sickness in that. Um, and how do you have both of those things? And Chanti Yates, who's just a brilliant, brilliant costume designer, it was so fun to build this uh, day by day. But even the, the hair was something that we were working on, like the, the precise shade of that red so that it feels fun and bombastic, but also believable and, and grounded in, in something uh, twisted and menacing at the same time. So yeah, it was, it was a, I would say, gradual process. Um, and, uh, and yeah. But, but some aspects just came ready to go, like, like the monkey was ready to go. <laughs> I didn't have to spend as long finding. She was amazing from the, from the outset. <laughs> lots of uh, lots of uh, background and, and lots of little touches. Um, we had to talk about the opening scene, Paul. That that moment and everything that went into creating that. Because how many days did Joel shoot that sequence total? Whatever day I say, it'll probably like knock five off at Ridley Scott. I think I think we shot that opening sequence over nine shooting days, which. I don't know any other director that could do that. Like, I think we traveled to Malta like a week early, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But I, the opening, the first day on set, it was me and Pedro, and we were consciously kept 
in the tents kind of outside of the city walls and we were sitting sitting in the tents and I was smoking a cigarette and we were kind of marching around the place and Ridley comes in with a cigar and <laughs> we're all just sitting there I was absolutely shitting myself and he <laughs> looks at me and he goes you nervous and I was like didn't know what the appropriate answer it was so I was like ah. he's like bang your nerves are no fucking good to me. So, <laughs> marches us out, cameras are turning over. Three, like, like, my game on set was like, try and spot the cameras. Wait, um, is this okay? I think it's okay. okay. All right. <laughs> um, and then just the cameras are turning over. And that, like, that, that scene when um, Yugurth is doing the blessing of the troops was the first scene that we shot. And that was how, that's what we walked into and i think that's part of ridley's genius where he's like we're on this ride together let's not waste any time because time is precious and and and, and ridley uses time like a genius so that was that was a real blessing for him i think um is that the scene where you broke pedro's shoulder i'm kidding i know you didn't oh, do it i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding it was, it was kieran culkin um <laughs> it was kieran culkin i'm just kidding no but Connie, you do get to act alongside Pedro, who is not here, but he is also dreamy. But Acrius, he is, he's also dreamy. He is, sorry. <laughs> uh, but the Acrius character, I would love for you um, to talk, because y'all also have some incredible scenes together. The scene that you have with him, I think, is one that is very emotional and very moving, and it shows your relationship, but it really only pales to what you two do towards the end. And yeah, I'd just love for you to talk about Pedro a little bit as a scene partner and what he brought to this performance. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I mean, that man just carries, I don't know, boatloads of charm, like in, in the trails behind him. And you just like, <laughs> kind of like notice this energy arrive on set. It's actually the same as when you were walking on set. It's like, it, like when Denzel was walking into the set, it was sort of like the curtains were still moving <laughs> after he passed through them. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's true. I believe you. Um, and Pedro, there's something so gentle about him that it just like touches you right away and you feel so loved when you're with him, like you just feel so safe. And and then he's a little naughty, which is fantastic. And, um, and so there's like always like this little sort of like clay in the game, inside of a game, which is really fun. Um, so I think in the beginning it was supposed to just be like, this sort of, she, he comes from, from work and are you hungry, dear, kind of scene. And instead it became a scene where it's sort of like, you have to win me over before you come close. And it was such a, it was like little minute things that we didn't speak, but that just happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul, I'm gonna give you the last word and then we're gonna go have fun drinks, there's coffee out there too, so I'm gonna end it here. But uh, I think a lot of people have been waiting for this movie, but there's an equal number of people who were like, you know, they haven't had the experience these folks have to know that it's brilliant. They're like, hey, this was such a great thing. What would you say to folks and audiences about what it is about this film that it does continue the legacy? Because I think you've seen it now and can speak to that. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I mean, it's your movie, sir. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, this film wears the legacy of the first film with intense pride and honor, but I think it takes it in a direction that drives that honor and respect through the roof. I think it's made by the only man who could ever touch it in Ridley Scott, and personally, as like his friend and his long admirer, I think is one of his finest pieces of work that I've seen in recent times. And I'm so utterly proud of his work, my work, and everybody sitting here, everybody who's not sitting here. I, um, I don't think anybody can take that away from us now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's getting the crunch Um I want to thank you all for your brilliant performances. It is, I, I just can't wait.